through how we get from the very beginning of kernel uh, initialization to uh, user space running. And in my wildest fantasy, should I go about 10 times faster than usual, we could actually talk about initRDs. Although since uh, Matthew Garrett covered that well in his talk yesterday, I feel safe in skipping it. So a high level summary of this talk is shown in this diagram. Everyone please sit back down. Uh, it's not as bad as it looks. By going through this step by step, hopefully by the end of the talk, you will uh, have some idea what the different boxes in here mean and not just feel terror and alarm in seeing so many arrows and different colors as you might logically do now. So uh, let's go to the first step of boot, which is off. Off is very simple because the system has no power and is not doing anything. False. We're already puzzled and it, we're only at off. But there's much more to come. So why is that not always true? Um, if your system has wake on LAN enabled, you might find that when you have turned it off and you believe it off, it is off and you want it to be off, that actually there is a LED illuminated on the network port and that is because the system is listening for a, ma a magic packet. And what is listening? Obviously it is not Linux. We are not to Linux yet, but it may be on a desktop or server system, the baseboard management controller, which is a separate microcontroller from the uh, SOC, or it may be the platform controller hub. The platform controller hub is what runs the now famous active management technology that would, for example, let allow for remote administration of network point of sale terminals. Uh, this might be a good thing if you are a uh, a store with a lot of cash registers in it. It might not be such a good thing to have remote management if it is your personal laptop that we're speaking about. Uh, in order to understand in more detail how the man active management technology works, we can consider this also somewhat forbidding diagram from Ron Minich's excellent talk at Embedded Linux Conference 2017. This also is a really great talk, which uh, anyone interested in this topic is advised to look up. I like this diagram because it explains pretty clearly what the platform controller hub and the main system CPU actually do, what their division of labor is. But it also uh, is, in some sense, general purpose enough that you can understand uh, what happens on non x86 systems in that before even the general purpose bootloader like uh, Grub or U-Boot can run. There's a number of system initializations, bringing up power supplies, stabilizing clocks, um, probing buses, and uh, most importantly of all, in some regard, uh, bringing up the DRAM controller that have to happen even before the main bootloader can run. So on ARM systems that I work on most of the time, this capability would be represented in a shim bootloader that most likely actually will run on the main system SOC. Uh, in the x86 systems, the uh, code that is running uh, in this pre-initialization pre stage is actually Minix running on the platform controller hub as is well known. There are unfortunately seven uh, CVEs uh, that are, uh, have been issued. Uh, regarding this Minix implementation on the Platform Controller Hub. There's a free tool that you can download from Intel to check your system. When I check this laptop with that tool from Intel, it says my system is vulnerable and I should consult the manufacturer of the device. When I go to Lenovo's website and I uh, see if there are patches, I learn that, quote, Lenovo is researching the problem. That's what it says in the table of, uh, in the, on the support page for Active Management Engine. Oh well, a uh, possible approach to getting rid of the uh, license uh, checker and the embedded web, uh, the embedded uh, server and so forth that is actually running on Minix in the early boot is to use the ME Cleaner and the non-extensible reduced firmware project that Minich's group is spearheading. Uh, the uh, project is uh, breathtakingly ambitious in that it um, intends to replace some of the system management code that runs at earliest boot uh, 
and UEFI and the main system bootloader and systemd. So it has been a few years since we've had a new init system, and I'm sure that the, <laughs> I'm sure that the package maintainers out there would welcome now that they have systemd init scripts changing to a, a, a different system altogether. Um, now, if you find the idea of having unpatched vulnerabilities in the system pre-initialization disturbing, you might want to uh, not go so far as to uh, run management engine cleaner, which is a little bit risky. Um, you might want to buy a piece of hardware that has the management engine turned off. Uh, the good news is you can buy uh, systems from Purism or System76, uh, vendors who you would expect turning it off. Dell recently announced that the A would also offer laptops with management engine turned off. If you want such a system from Dell, it's for some reason $21 more. So uh, enough about pre-bootloader initialization. Let's talk about bootloaders. Uh, so to do that, I am going to drag you over to the console window, especially if I can make, figure out how to move this. So that you can watch me make typing errors, apparently. And for your viewing pleasure here, I actually have a copy of U-Boot. U-Boot is usually an embedded bootloader, so what could I possibly show you about it, given that this is a x86 system, and at no point am I using any virtualization here. But actually, there is a sandbox image of U-Boot, which I will now attempt to use to boot this board, boot this laptop. So it's auto-booting, but alas, it doesn't work because it's a sandbox. But what U-Boot has done is it's read the kernel image, it's read a device tree, it has parsed the kernel image uh, to prepare to boot it, it's parsed the device tree, and then it tries to jump into Linux uh, kernel, and alas, it actually doesn't work because it's a sandbox. But uh, this U-Boot sandbox is really a wonderful development tool. If you have ever worked on bootloader development, uh, when you make a change to the bootloader, you typically have to pull out uh, something like a bus pirate and attach it to the spy and reflash the NUR. Uh, if you have made a simple mistake, then uh, not only are there no log files, but sometimes all you see is line noise, which is not a, a great debugging experience. If you make a mistake with this sandbox, then you get a segmentation violation and you get a, a bash prompt back. So this is about a hundred times faster development process than uh, the normal bootloader development. You may be wondering how it is that, um, that the U-Boot tried to read the device tree and the uh, uh, kernel image. That's because there's a mock storage device here. If I list the uh, files, in the FAT file system on the device host, the fake host bus, uh, device zero, partition one, there's a kernel image and a device tree, and I can <coughs> read the partition table from the device. So partition table code development is also uh, you know, something that it's nice to practice in this environment. Uh, of course, since this is uh, x86, I also can single step the bootloader. So if you really wanted to learn how bootloaders work, this is a, a great toy, and uh, it's really fast to compile and to use. Um, and uh, U-Boot is a, a project I really enjoy working on. So with that, we can return to the slides. And I've just shown you those things. And so now we're uh, through the first little bit of the diagram. We have uh, talked about the shim bootloader. We've gotten into the regular bootloader, which could be Grub on x86 rather than U-Boot, which is what a lot of the embedded world uses. The uh, bootloader will read the kernel command line uh, and pass it to the kernel, and also the device tree or the ACPI, Advanced Configuration and Power Interface, and then it actually enters the kernel code. Um, so uh, the command line tells uh, the kernel uh, where the uh, root 
Uh, file system is to be found. Matthew Garrett talked about that at some length yesterday, so I think I don't need to talk about that more. But I owe you a little bit more a description of what the device tree and the ACPI tables are uh, for people who are not looking at those all the time. So the uh, ACPI tables are what uh, is in use for ARM64 uh, and for x86. The device tree is used in ARM and other popular embedded architectures. The device tree is a little bit simpler to work with. Um, it is typically a file and slash boot or also sometimes on a, on a separate flash. Uh, you can find out what's in a device tree with strings. The device tree source is part of the kernel source and there is a provided compiler to compile it with. So modifying this file is pretty straightforward. Um, the uh, device tree I sometimes cutely call the address book for the kernel. It has really a list of devices that are installed on the system, so it describes the hardware to the kernel when the kernel starts. And for each of the devices, it has the registers at which the kernel may uh, communicate with the devices and configure them. The ACPI tables, like pretty much everything else in x86, from, uh, from my way of thinking, are a little bit more of a boggle. Uh, but since we have them here on this system, let us, let us have a look at them. Um, so my favorite way to look at the ACPI tables is to use the ACPI dump command, which is kind of cat. And this is the most entertaining, if not the most informative invocation of it I know. So if we grew up through the ACPI tables for Windows, we learn to our happiness that if we chose to install Windows 2001, Windows 2006, Windows 2013, or Windows NT, that this laptop is ready. So I'll, I'll certainly consider that. Uh, somehow, if we grep through the tables for Linux, there's only one lie. So I won't offer any speculation about why that might be. Um, more informatively, perhaps, from the engineering point of view, if we look in the kernel D message buffer for DT, which stands for descriptor table, we can see that in early boot, which is my excuse for talking about this, that the kernel has read a bunch of the ACPI uh, information from the ROM where it is stored and put it in SysFS. And uh, as with the device tree, learns uh, what is in the system on, on which it is installed. So the ACPI tables are a little bit different from the device tree. The device tree uh, is a declarative file. It looks a lot like JSON. It's a good question why it is not just JSON, but it's not. Um, the ACPI tables include not just configuration and addresses of devices, but also some methods uh, that actually are run and associated with those devices. So we're now through the bootloader and we are ready to start the kernel. So what kind of program is the kernel? Well, the kernel is an ELF binary. This uh, may not be very informative. If in fact, you've never heard what an ELF binary, you've never heard of ELF binaries before. But actually, your, your system is liable to be chock-a-block with ELF binaries. For example, if we say file bin date, we see that date, a program with which everyone is familiar, is actually an ELF executable and linking format shared object. So what is an ELF? Well, it means that the binary conforms to a POSIX standard for the layout of uh, executables and uh, metadata and uh, in, in the binary file. So if we say read elf minus s to look at the sections and bin date, we see a list that has uh, uh, things like uh, read only data and uh, block started by symbols. That's kind of a zero page for a binary. And also somewhere in here is the .txt file that has the actual executable part. 
And in fact, the kernel's uh, composition as a binary is somewhat different. That can be obscured by the fact that what we have in slash boot for the running kernel in the system is actually compressed. It is a BZ image. Z stands for zip at some level. Uh, we can use a tool that is provided by the kernel source to get the actual kernel image out of the running compressed kernel image. When we do that, we see that the kernel is a 64-bit uh, Linux executable. So date, if we go back up here, hopefully nobody's feeling nauseous watching me move, the, move around here. Uh, date actually had an interpreter because it is an ELF shared object, but the kernel is an ELF executable the uh, interpreter for the date is LD Linux, which you may be aware is the dynamic loader linker for Linux. The kernel doesn't have an interpreter. It actually interprets itself, uh, which is not just a humorous statement, but is actually so, as I will show you in a moment. Um, go back here to the slide just for a second. Uh, we see that the kernel is an ELF binary, so therefore it must start like other ELF binaries start. But how do ELF binaries start? Well, uh, a lot of the binaries that we have uh, in the root file system with our distro are part of libc or core utils. As the name libc suggests, these are programs written in C. So if you've ever written a C program, which a lot of us old people have, you know that it starts int main, int argc, char star star argv. So a good guess might be that the, these C programs start in the main function. But if that is the right answer, then where exactly are the argc and argv coming from? And of course, that is why the uh, ELF shared object needs an interpreter of libc it needs to get information from the environment in which it is running. So just to show you that very quickly, uh, I have uh, compiled the core utils, which has, uh, for example, date in it. And so this is the same as the date that's in slash, only it is not stripped, so it has the symbols in it, which is just more fun. And so if I say GDB, source date, start date under the debugger. And then I can say run, and you can see that the date prints out, so it really is date. And then if I say info files, we see the sections that uh, we were just talking about a moment ago. Uh, and let's set a breakpoint on main, so we can stop on main and see how main is actually getting started. So I say run. All right, so we've broken at the main uh, function, and that looks kind of like what you'd expect. But what may, might be more surprising, through the magic of odd commands I have in my .gdb init file, we can now get a backtrace and see what started main. And in fact, before main ran, when I type date, libc start main is running. It is actually calling main. And before libc start main runs, is a mysterious function called underscore start. And it's a little bit hard to look at underscore start on x86. You actually have to run uh, GDB server because the system doesn't like it when you poke around in the copy of LD Linux that's actually running, since it is a shared library and other applications are using it. So we can go and look at an ARM binary, and let's face it, I just like ARM better anyhow. So um, I have here an extremely stupid program called Showbits. You can probably kind of guess what Showbits does. It's not very long or sophisticated, but it's good for a demo. And then I have another one, uh, which is uh, ARM binary. So we will look at it with the ARM GDB. B 
And uh, if we now say info files, we see something very much like before. I promise that's the last time I'll show you that. We can go and look at the entry point of the program, which is where the execution starts. We use the list command from GDB. And uh, we actually now are in ARM's implementation of start.s. So at this point, you may freak out and say, I don't know any assembly. I can't understand this. And your mind may, may shut down. But don't panic, because in fact, the initialization code in Linux is, for the most part, really quite easy to understand. Um, it is well commented. Uh, and a lot of the things it does are just plain obvious. For example, here we're, we're um, rating zero to the frame pointer, which is the ordinal number of the frame we're in. So this is the beginning of the call stack. There's no uh, caller before this, so it's frame pointer zero. And we're zeroing the link register, which is the address to which the return function in a frame returns, because there's no frame before this one. This is the first frame. Um, GDB is wonderful, but it is not the best code viewer ever. So is this font large enough? OK, I'll take that as a yes. So this is actually the code for start.s. I love this kind of code because it's so brute force. How do we start uh, the main uh, in a natural way? We basically just write the stack uh, by copying the right values there. We copy the right answers in. This is like doing homework problems where you know what, that the answer for the speed of light, but you don't know how to derive it. So um, this uh, assembly, even if you don't read assembly, is really quite readable. You can see it says this is the canonical entry point, usually the first thing to run. So what this assembly is doing is it's providing the runtime context for the application. A, a running uh, program in Linux needs a stack, a heap and three file descriptors. Um, you might wonder, what, what does this have to do with the kernel, and, and why do I care? I thought this was a talk about the boot process. But um, the point is that the kernel also needs a context in which to run. That, and, but the kernel has to provide it itself, um, which is why it, it does not have an interpreter. So uh, clearly, at this point, I am going to show you that the same trick works on the kernel. So I won't keep you any longer. I'll just show you by going to the kernel source directory. And so we can say GDB VM Linux. This is now an unstripped copy of VM Linux. That's why it takes a while to read. If we now say info files, and uh, the kernel has some different uh, sections in it because it has ones that are called dot init something. These are cars, this section corresponds to the part of the kernel source that's labeled with underscore init. This is uh, methods that are needed only at kernel boot on the boot uh, logical boot processor zero that are not used again while the system is running. So they're in special sections of the ELF that are freed when the kernel is up. And so in order to see how the kernel really, really starts, we can look at what is in the beginning of init.txt. And you can already sort of guess what, what the answer is going to be, which is that we are in some architecture-specific assembly, uh, in this case called head64.s. And if we go and look at that file, uh, we see, uh, once again, even though it, once again it's assembly, that it's not actually that terrifying. We have a function here called start cp0, whose, uh, whose purpose you can probably guess. And you can see, once again, we're setting up the stack and then jumping to C code. Uh, up above, a little bit, I point out a, a, a different function that I won't go into called secondary startup, which is for the secondary cores, not cpu0. So what happens with CPU0? Uh, after setting up the heap and the stack, we actually call a function called x86-64 start kernel. Start kernel is actually the main function of the kernel in the sense that, just in the sense that the actually named main function uh, 
is the first uh, function in C that runs from the assembly when a regular Linux binary starts, just so start kernel is the arch independent first uh, function that call that runs when the kernel jumps to C. And so go past all that. Okay, so here is a extremely high level summary of what's in start kernel. Uh, the kernel initializes some data structures. It actually outputs most of the D message messages that you see in the beginning of boot. It uh, really is just setting up a lot of data structures. It initializes the scheduler, the IRQs. When timekeeping init runs, then the timestamps magically stop being exactly zero and start, the time starts to advance. All the way up until the very end of this function when the humbly named rest init runs, there is only one thread of execution and the kernel is only running on one core. And furthermore, there's, since there's no preemption and no scheduling, these function calls actually run synchronously one after another after another. So this is the simplest phase of execution of the entire life cycle of the kernel. Uh, it is much like a real-time operating system like QNX or VxWorks. Uh, it actually is kind of easy to up, uh, understand up till rest in it happens when we get preemption and multi-threading and locks and RCU and other horrible, scary things like that that uh, make the kernel so hard to debug. Um, so going back to this, this uh, diagram, we've gotten through the bootloader. The kernel has actually started. It's in its main function, and it gets to rest in it where the trouble begins. Um, what rest in it actually does is it spawns the second thread uh, which is running a, a function called kernel init, and then it starts CPU idle. Now, when first faced with the prospect that early in boot, the second thread, well, the, really the first thread, but uh, the secondary thread is running CPU idle, this seems bizarre. Why would the kernel run CPU idle on this thread when it has so much work left to do to come up? The answer to that question is that uh, the scheduler has to assign work to kernel threads and the scheduler isn't running yet. So this really is bootstrapping. So until the scheduler is ready to assign tasks to this thread, uh, it's just running CPU idle. So then the rest of the work of the kernel initialization is actually performed by kernel init. And the next thing kernel init does is actually start SMP uh, it actually calls this secondary start kernel that we saw before in that function, uh, uh, head64, and uh, that program head64.s. The best way I know to understand that is to use a set of kernel, kernel uh, uh, tracing tools called BCC. BCC is uh, eBPF compiler collection. And eBPF is extended Berkeley packet filter. And if you've never heard of them before, you still have no idea what those are. But uh, BCC is a, a really wonderful, easy to use collection of kernel uh, query tools created largely by your fellow Australian, Brendan Gregg, who I'm sure has spoken about at this meeting before. Here's a list of the tools that come with BCC. They are Python that wraps some C that compiles to bytecode that interacts with a virtual machine running inside the kernel, which uh, that has to be true because I would never dare make anything like that up. Uh, what these tools do is uh, suggested by their names. We have, for example, XFS slower, uh, not XFS faster, interestingly, hardirqs.py, uh, TCP tracer, and so forth and so on. The one I want to actually show you to illustrate uh, SMP, since as you will vaguely now recall, we were looking at the Linux boot process, is one called off CPU time dot pi. Doing so well in my demos, watch me screw this one up. Off CPU time dot pi, yes. Oh, I didn't change directory to tools, that's why. 
Okay, so off CPU dot type, time dot pi is a tool that traces the time that different threads of execution are blocked on the kernel. And of course, it is supposed to be used for serious diagnostic purposes, not the silly purpose for which I am now using it, which is seeing what the traces of exec system execution look like when the system is essentially idle, since, as you can easily see right now, it's pretty much doing nothing. So what we've got here is different stack traces and the number of counts where they occurred. This is very much like the stack traces that you see from, from GDB. Um, we have here the stack trace on core zero, which shows that um, CPU idle is running do idle, and that it is part of the call chain that started with verify CPU, uh, went to x86-64 start kernel, and start kernel that we were just looking at, then went into rest in it. Uh, so that's the call chain on uh, core zero. If we look at one of the other cores, for example, uh, core two, we see pretty much the same thing, except that the secondary cores, when they are brought up, don't need to recapitulate all the initialization of data structures and the starting of the scheduler and so forth that happens on the main core. They actually uh, basically just run this much smaller set of tasks with start secondary. Although there are, uh, of course, uh, per CPU threads that I don't have time to discuss that run on the secondary cores. So we are almost, almost done with the boot process now. Um, we, from kernel init, run do init calls, which is a seven stages of execution that probes device drivers, brings up the network, sing, uh, brings up um, uh, file systems. Uh, this is the part of boot where, from my point of view, most bugs occur because uh, this, this system is fully asynchronous, asynchronous now, and that might not be what you would necessarily wish for starting up hardware. Uh, it's not good if the try to probe the device on the bus before the bus is ready, for example. But uh, at long last, the system starts user space by calling into a NIT, and uh, we are actually booted. So um, here in its full glory is this diagram, which uh, hopefully everybody sort of kind of a little bit understands what's going on with it now. And uh, finally, I will summarize. So uh, I wanted to plug U-Boot, which I think is the only talk, uh, topic in this talk that has not had a really good individual presentation by somebody else during the conference. Um, there even was a talk this morning by Sven Dorahite, I think, Dorahite, about U-Root, which is part of the non-extensible reduced firmware project. Um, I tried to make the case that uh, looking at the kernel as an ELF program that needs resources that are provided by uh, uh, assembly files is, is helpful in understanding how it starts analogous to regular user space binaries. I told you about how several processors and a variety of software components participate in the boot process, but that nonetheless, the boot process in some ways is simpler than, to understand than the rest of the kernel execution because there's less going on at early boot than uh, once the system is fully up. So with that, I'd like to thank a couple of my friends for finding grievous, grievous mistakes in earlier versions of this talk. And I'll say that these slides, if you download them, have uh, lots of references uh, hyperlinked. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Alison. Um, I do believe we have a couple of minutes for questions, if there are any. I've oh, got one over there. So you've waddled in the existing complexity of it. If you had it to do all over, what would you change? About the boot process? Yes. Um, I guess I'd wish for uh, an easier way to express dependencies to prevent 
things from starting out of order during the init calls. That, that is a, a source of some pain. I, I think the way of expressing those dependencies, to, at least to me, sometimes is a little bit perplexing to make sure that, that the bus is available before the, the device on it is probed. Uh, having devices only sometimes appear at boot in slash dev is, is a never-ending problem, I think, for people who support Linux Carl. Are there any more questions? We have one here. Saying uh, device initialization and stuff it was all in, in parallel now, uh, how come uncompressing the init RAMFS isn't? Isn't, isn't which? Uh, isn't also parallel. It seems to um, block for a while. Yeah, so uh, the uh, kernel init uh, actually looks to see if there is an init RAMFS. Yeah, I, I don't know uh, actually if the uncompression of init RAMFS is, uh, is asynchronous or if it actually blocks. It feels like it blocks. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure why that would be, but yeah, I mean, in systems you really want a fast boot, you don't typically use a RAMFS. Embedded devices rarely have them unless there's some special purpose need. Uh, thank, thank you for a great talk. Uh, for your two second boot up to video, um, once the kernel's up and running, are you resuming a suspended image or or is that two seconds from a cold boot? That would, that would be a great thing to do. The uh, processor that we used in the project I worked on did not support that feature. Uh, it would su uh, suspend to memory, but if we would have done that and you would have gone and left your car at the airport while we were refreshing the DRAM, uh, while you were off on a two-week trip to Australia, when you came back, probably the battery would be dead and it wouldn't start. And we couldn't suspend to disk. so. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's uh, a lot of things you could do uh, if you had known when you picked the processor that you were going to have this requirement. But uh, the joy of being an embedded developer is uh, you don't get to pick the hardware, you just are supposed to make it work, so. Any last questions? One more. Simply delaying the starter motor. Or, uh, did you consider simply <laughs> delaying the starter motor? Just make it crank a little bit. I like your way of thinking. I'm not sure my boss would have uh, allowed that. I don't think. I don't think the automakers that were the end customers would have uh, uh, really uh, found that acceptable. But that that works for me. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, the correct solution that I think most people are using now is to put the smarts in the in the camera. So we actually made it work with Linux, but the reason that Mobileye became successful, I think, is largely because of this National Highway Transportation Safety Administration ruling, because desperate car companies who were afraid of actually not being allowed to sell their vehicles in the United States at all, if they didn't meet this requirement, uh, I think just kind of uh, ponied up and uh, uh, you know, paid Mobileye to make the problem go away. So. All righty. Please thank Allison once more. Thank okay. you. Well taken out of steam. Yeah. Uh, there will be a short 10-minute break now, and fo following that, there will be Matthew Wilcox discussing NVM Express. <laughs>